so uh, I'm not sure if uh, so let me pull up the first image on the slide. Anybody you know could probably you know help me with which place this 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 picture is from, or which city in India, or which state in India does this? Uh, God's own country. <laughs> Absolutely, Kerala, right? Uh, so that's God's own country. <laughs> Uh, how about the second picture? Ah. A little, little further north from Himachal and, uh, you know, uh, Kashmir. <laughs> so Kashmir, uh, which is great. And how about the third city, uh, which you can see over here, the land of those beautiful yellow taxis. Yellow city yellow city of joy. City of joy. So, uh, uh, so bang on, correct. Why are these three cities so close to me? So Kerala is where my mom is from, uh, so which is by the Menon in my surname. A lot of people ask me, you've got a pretty long name and, you know, should I call you Mr. Menon? Should I call you Mr. Malik? Should I call you Mr. Menon Malik? So that's, I'm going to give you the, the debrief there. So Kerala is where my mom comes from, uh, which is why I've kept the Menon surname as part of my name. Uh, Kashmir is where my father is from, so that's where the Malik comes in from. And uh, Calcutta is where my wife is from. So it's the north, south, and the east are all part of my family. And, uh, you know, only the west is left out. And uh, up until about a year and a half back, my parents stayed in, in Mumbai in the west. So I, I think I've covered all, all four parts of India. And, uh, you know, we celebrate pretty much all festivals to the year, uh, which is, I think, you know, there's unity and diversity. And I think you know, my family is sort of a testament to that, just given uh, the odd combination of there is. <laughs> So, uh, uh, about a little bit more, I, I completed my engineering from BITS uh, in 2009. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. Uh, I went on to do my Six Sigma Black Belt certification uh, you know, between 2012 and 2014. Uh, and as I started working with data, I realized that uh, you know you need to move beyond uh, just just the Excel pivots. Uh, there, there needs to be more that, that, that you need to, to learn. Uh, and the funny story is, what actually took me to ISB for my for my data science program was I actually failed an interview. I couldn't crack an interview. Uh, this was back I think in 2014-15, where uh, I, I think I answered all the questions on on Six Sigma well, but uh, when they asked me about the newer and emerging technologies, I, I couldn't answer them. And that's when I realized that you know one needs to keep uh, keep uh, abreast with what's happening in the world uh, with technology that, that, that's out there. And that's what led me to, to, to go to the ISB and complete uh, my uh, certification program from data, on data science from ISB. Uh, so that's my uh, educational sort of uh, journey. And then in terms of organizations that I've been with, I started off my career with, with Linde Group. Uh, it's, it's, it's a German, and now it's merged with the Dow Chemical Group in the US. So it's, it's a big uh, gas manufacturer, liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, the industrial oxygen, industrial uh, uh, gases. Uh, I was there for about six years, and then I moved to telecom, where I was with Idea Cellular, which is also uh, you know part of the Birla Group, essentially. Um, uh, that's where I began working with, with large data sets, handling uh, large amounts of customer information. And then uh, that was my first sort of brace with, with big data in a way. Uh, I had a good fortune of then moving to Amazon where I worked there in uh, as an operation excellence uh, manager for, uh, for North America uh, in, in the finance domain. Uh, where we worked again with, with, with large data sets. And then finally, uh, I moved uh, uh, at the moment with Home Depot, which is a large home improvement retailer. And I'm at the moment looking after the operation excellence and quality assurance for products that are shipping out of South Asia and Middle Eastern Europe. So a wide variety of industries. And I think what's helped across all of them is uh, the ability, let's say, to be able to handle data and draw insights. And that's essentially why uh, I'll be you know, sharing with you my journey as, as we progress through, uh, you know, through this. So uh, I think one of the quotes that has, that's always stood by me and uh, when I learned this during my Six Sigma certification was around, in God we trust, all others bring data. So, you know, uh, W. Edward Deming said this, uh, uh, he's one of the, uh, you know, modern greats about inequality. Uh, and then essentially uh, he helped basically Japan come back out of World War II with, with his philosophies around quality. So I think there's a lot of power in that statement in God we trust all of us bring data because if you don't sort of bring data to the table, then you're just making assumptions and with assumptions uh, and it's just discussions, we're not really going to be able to make impact with business. So um, so let, let's, let's move forward. Uh, so a little bit of a quiz again as we go forward. I try to keep this interactive, so feel free to you know jump in and answer. Anybody knows who this gentleman is? Okay. 
So uh, this gentleman is he's he's John D. Rockefeller. Uh, you know he's he's known for uh, striking big uh, because of uh, the discovery of oil and essentially controlling a large part of the oil uh, in the U.S. So he founded the Standard Oil Company in 1870, uh, and his wealth sort of reached exorbitant proportions uh, because of kerosene and gasoline that that grew in importance during the Industrial Revolution. At one point in time, he 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 pretty much owned 90 percent of the oil in the U.S. through his organization, and uh, he's considered as one of the wealthiest people of all time. So you know, when I when I say that. Uh, uh, when you adjust his 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 uh, his, his self worth or, or his net worth in 2019 inflation adjusted dollar terms, it's about a four four hundred and eighteen billion dollars, which is approximately twice as much as what maybe Jeff Bezos or um, you know or Elon Musk, for, for example, who are the current uh, wealthiest people in the world have. So that's uh, that's that that's the power of that man. That's that's what he owned. Uh, Funny enough, in 1911, you know, his company, the Standard Oil Company, was was broken down into about 30 other companies as it became regulated. The industry became regulated, and to till this date, Exxon Mobil and Chevron are actually part of uh, you know Standard Oil Company, which was back in the 1800s, and they still today are part of the Fortune 50 companies. So that's the kind of impact that oil had, right? And and what John D. Rockefeller once said was the you know the best business in the world is, is a well-run oil company, and the second best business is a badly run oil company. So that's the power of oil in the industrial revolution. But uh, uh, does that have the same sort of significance in the 21st century, uh, which is what, what, what brings us to what are the top organizations today in the world, right? Uh, if you think of it, uh, it it's going to be either Amazon or Facebook or, or Google. Those are the organizations that, 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 that come to mind. So essentially the FANG stocks, right, the Facebook, the Apples, the Amazons, Netflix, and the Googles of the world are essentially ruling the roost. And that's that's because of a couple of things: Techno, uh, data, of course, uh, and then and then technology. Right? They have the right product, uh, which people get hooked on to. But then it's more than the product, right? It's the technology which they're bringing in, and they're they're constantly innovating and, and scaling. So to put that in perspective, in in the 21st century, and uh, uh, last year has been a tough year, right? COVID has has seen an impact uh, you know, across all major industries. But funny enough, when you compare the Fang stocks. Uh, versus what the S&P 500 has done uh, in the last one year, you'll be surprised to see that, uh, uh, or, or maybe not so much of a surprise, but they've sort of outperformed the S&P 500. And uh, uh, what this graph is essentially telling you is that had you invested $100 uh, 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 on December 31st, 2019 uh, as an index, how much would that have risen uh, by the end of the first uh, end of the COVID year, so December 2020, and all the S&P 500, which is like a benchmark index, like the census or, census or the Nifty in India, uh, that would have risen from $100 to $116, as compared to, let's say, take a look at Amazon, which would be at $176 if you had invested $100, and then, uh, you know, Apple going up to $182. So what this is telling you is, despite the pandemic, despite everything that's happening around us, the technology companies are uh, uh, booming. They will continue to grow, and that's essentially because of a couple of things. One, of course, the product that they have in the market, and second is the technology. Right? People can stay home and and, and still utilize these apps, utilize these. Uh, for example, Netflix. Right? What an amazing uh, time for, for for them to see a boom. Uh, for for example, I never had a Netflix account up until the pandemic hit. Right? When the pandemic hit, I thought, okay, now that I have some spare time. What do I do with that? Uh, you know, let's 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 binge watch. Uh, some series and, there, and therefore the Netflix subscription, just like me, many other people would have, would have taken it up and, and that's essentially helped them uh, uh, quadruple and maybe even uh, triple uh, uh, their revenue. So, so that's the power of, of what these companies have done and essentially the product technology and, and the core theme is data. So essentially why I started with oil, oil might have been what it was in, in, in the 18th, 19th century. Can we still sort of assume that to be what, what's ruling the roost? Not really, it's, it's data. Right, and uh, Clive Humby, uh, who's a British mathematician, in 2006 he said that data is the new oil. So, so, so great uh, far sight. Right, he probably already noticed what people uh, like like me and maybe others had had not noticed uh, what these what these companies, technology based companies, can really do with with consumer data. Uh, so, let's understand how much data is actually created every day. Any any guesses? Like, uh, would you know? Uh, the amount of data we as individuals or humans just uh, create and generate every day. 
just a random guess if anybody would have to think of it. How many GBs or how many terabytes would, would it be? Okay, so I didn't see any uh, inputs on uh, on Slido, so I'm going to answer that question for you. Uh, so 2.5. So, so Vikram, uh, we, uh, the participants are also uh, typing in the chat, so you can also refer that. Oh, perfect. Um, I will have to then switch. Uh, uh, Vikram, uh, why don't you? Uh, I'll, 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 let me track the Slido questions. I'll post them to you. Um, sure. Perfect. Thank you, Shamila. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of uh, bytes of data, right? I heard exabytes, absolutely. Uh, so two, actually, the number is 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. Now, uh, in, as of 2018, from a Forbes article around this, uh, if you had to sort of demystify that number, right? It, it sounds big, but if you had to sort of store that much of data, uh, what would what would it entail? So to save that amount of data which is being created in a day, you would essentially need twenty five lakh or two point five million one TB hard disks a day to to save the amount of data that's being generated. Right, that that is humongous, right? I, imagine that that that's the amount of data which people are, are creating every day. Now, uh, when Humpy said this, of course, uh, I'm trying to get rid of this. Yeah, when Humpy said this in 2006, he probably did not know uh, how easy it is going to be in the future to really uh, generate data and essentially uh, to get data from from consumers. Now, or if you think, just think about it, oil. To extract oil, refine oil, it's a pretty cumbersome process, right? You need to have the right setup, there'll be investment. Uh, it, it'll take its own sweet time uh, for us to be able to refine crude oil and actually get uh, the components like, like petrol or gasoline which you want to use. But think about uh, think about data, right? Uh, data is really like it's pretty dirt cheap. Get you know to use a mobile data, especially in India, uh, uh, and, and have a have a, a graphic there. It's not very difficult, right? The the input cost. From a, from a consumer standpoint, at least, is, is is pretty pretty negligible, and we are as consumers giving up our data literally for free. I mean, by signing up on those apps uh, and 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 tick marking all those obligations which we don't really read, uh, we are letting people uh, you know utilize our data. Uh, so that's why I see the dichotomy in in Humvee's statement from from today's world. Maybe back in 2006, yes, it made a lot of sense. Uh, saving data, generating data was not so easy. So maybe it was similar to oil. But uh, in 2020, I think, or 21, uh, I think there's a dichotomy in that statement just purely because how easy it is to create content and uh, even people are giving it up for free. So from an infographic or a slide perspective, uh, that's the cost like comparison of mobile data, 1 GB data across the different countries in the world. Uh, and India is about 0.26 dollars. That's, that's less than a bottle of water for 1 GB of data. Uh, so, 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 so think about that, uh, reflect upon that. Uh, uh, you know how easy it is for people to, to consume data, and then I, I like this uh, quote from the Social Dilemma, which is a Netflix movie. Uh, uh, you know why are we getting it so dirt cheap? Like what's really driving it, right? If you're not paying for the product or service, then essentially you are the product. So the reason why these technology companies are are uh, setting up stuff for free for you to really use their applications, use their uh, services in, in a way for free is because they are learning from your consumer behavior. They're learning from the insights. They're learning from your, from your, from your patterns of your purchases, from, from what you watch, from what you like, from what you, from what you, uh, you know, do not like, uh, that's, that's the real goal, right? If you can understand what a consumer, uh, likes and dislike, dislikes are, then potentially you can use that, uh, to build a better product and, and, and sell them something else or sell them a different service. And, and that's essentially why things are so lopsided, why it's so, it's so easy to, you know, buy 1 GB of, of data, use it, create data, uh, because these technology companies are actually using that for bettering their own application and bettering, bettering their own product or improving their own product. Now, with so much of data being created, uh, what do we do next, right? What do these technology companies do with it? So, so before we sort of go into that, uh, 
you need uh, you need to be able to consume that data in a way you need to be able to uh, analyze that data and for that you would need a specific people to hire right uh, the normal excel pivots or the normal excel analysis may not really work when you're work when, when you're dealing with let's say uh, the likes of data that, that, that we just discussed about. So that's where the whole concept of data science in a way came about. Uh, and as for Harvard Business Review, you know, the data scientist role or the data science team in a way, it's the hottest job of the 21st century, just because of, of what it entails. Now, uh, so what is data science? That would be the next logical question, right? And, and Drew Conway, who is a, a American uh, data scientist, uh, he actually came up with this Venn diagram, which said that data science is is a is a Venn diagram of uh, uh, hacking skills, uh, maths and knowledge, uh, uh, statistics knowledge, and then uh, you know domain expertise. So if you if you think about it, uh, hacking skills is not just about uh, being able to compute a program or, or or code, but it's actually about being able to extract that that large amount of data. Uh, mine that data, clean that data, and then format that data in a way which can be consumed by, by, by people in the team. Then the second piece is the, is the knowledge, right? If you, if you have the statistical analysis and knowledge around it, you'll then be able to draw insights, which is, which is as important as, as the first piece. And then the third piece, which is, uh, uh, which again is equally important because you might have the right skills to extract data, you might have the right skills to analyze data, but if you don't know what you're solving, if you don't know what, what the industry in need is or, or what the business need is, then all of that uh, uh, knowledge or hacking skills will, will not really help you out. So the domain expertise, understanding the business problem is equally important. And, and therefore the Venn diagram, I think very, very nicely sums up that it's a combination of programming, combination of statistics and a combination of the domain expertise. So uh, moving on to the next uh, bit, like, okay, now that you understood, you know, what uh, data science is, like what's, what's the basic, uh, you know, piece about it. Let's try to figure out uh, uh, how do we work with so much of data, right? Uh, like so many customers information, whether it's Facebook, Amazon, uh, Netflix, uh, what are the challenges essentially with, with, with this big data? And, and, and Thomas Davenport, who, you know, who's one of the top 50 business professors uh, globally, uh, uh, he said, uh, this was from Fortune magazine, essentially, you know, uh, it was voted as the top 50 business professors in 2012. Uh, he said that every company, uh, you know, has data, has big data. And then in the future, everybody will be in the data business. So you'll no longer be a, a you know, a product company. You'll essentially become a technology company because you'll be analyzing all this consumer insights and you'll be driving uh, the next product out of that. So what is big data right like how what, what are the challenges with it so it's defined essentially by the five v's uh, uh it's the volume uh, the variety the velocity the value and the veracity so let's understand what these five v's are uh velocity right velocity just by the sheer speed at which we are generating data uh and the and the different types of data uh, i think that in itself is a challenge which needs to be solved for right Volume, I think we covered that on the previous couple of slides where you mentioned just the large exorbitant amounts of data that's been created or generated. So how do you deal with that? Uh, variety is about structured and unstructured data, and we'll cover that on the next slide. Like, what's the difference between them? But uh, uh, think about it, right? Uh, sales data, uh, which 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 uh, organizations are able to extract, uh, probably easier to deal with. But how do you deal with the uh, audio visual data how do you deal with email data how do you deal with tweets right and that's essentially where data has transformed today it's not just your simple uh, spreadsheets it's into these different formats and uh, which is not really structured uh, in the veracity how do we how do we know that, that the data that we are getting is actually reliable so so that poses in itself uh, a challenge as well and then uh, the value piece right uh, the, the, you know, that we're getting, how do we draw the right value behind it? How do we understand uh, the business context about it? So, so these five V's essentially complicate uh, our life, right? And, and that's essentially what big data is. It's a combination of these five things. And uh, as a data scientist or as a data science team or as a business analytics uh, uh, course that you, that you would go through, uh, you, would, you would learn how to deal with these things and, and sift through this to, to draw insights. Now, the data scientist, uh, uh, job in itself 
uh, is seeing extreme shortages because imagine now the quantum of data being generated versus people who are getting into the subject or, or who have expertise around the three facets of programming, uh, maths and stats and business is the skill gap is, is pretty wide. So, uh, you know, quantum hub uh, article talks about it. There's at the moment a three X shortage between the number of jobs being posted for data scientists or data science team roles versus the actual people out there uh, who have the skill set. And uh, the 2020 shortage, you know, what we estimate worldwide at the moment is about 250,000. And this is only exponentially increased uh, as more and more companies realize that uh, it's, it's big data where the future is. Uh, you know, we would probably not be able to scale that gap uh, in the near term. So, just to finish Dr. up, yes. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Uh, I just no, want to see if this is a good time to stop for questions. Sure, sure, sure. All right. Uh, so, one of the first questions was, what are your thoughts on quantum computing and how can it influence software programming and the process of data analytics till uh, we reach 2030? Yeah, I think super question there. Uh, I think that 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 is the future, right? I mean, uh, quantum computing for sure. Uh, but then again, let's let's think of it this way. Uh, you know, how much uh, how much can we really store in terms of in terms of data? It's, it's it's getting really impossible just by the sheer amount of information that's been generated uh, that that we're able to store all of this. So quantum com computing uh, plugged in with with cloud computing uh, with you know and storage. Is, is essentially going to be uh, the, the future. And uh, on a slide ahead of this, I will actually share a little bit about how the data architecture piece really plays an, plays an important role. Because if you can't, uh, if you can't really get that, if you can't really store that information, if you can't really, uh, uh, you know, store it well, and uh, because storage again is is expensive, uh, we need to sort of sort of solve for that piece uh, equally. And uh, those companies who don't sort of spend over there and just continue to you know create apps, but but and, and create data, they would not be able to succeed. So uh, absolutely agree that uh, while we are giving away the data, uh, the companies who are extracting this information really need to also think about uh, about the data storage piece, the data architecture piece, and and uh, you know quantum computing, cloud storage will play a significant important role, uh, you know, to, to solve that. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, do you necessarily have to be a good coder to become a good data analyst? Uh, so uh, take my personal example, you know, uh, I tried to run away from coding uh, uh, in, in 11th and 12th, then ran away. I tried to, you know, uh, not do any more coding as I, as I went into uh, Six Sigma role. Uh, so it's not, it's not, it's not necessary, uh, but, uh, but I, I would think that you would need to know, uh, a few basics about about <coughs> programming. Specifically, if you are uh, want to be, and say just you know company information data, draw insights, draw some you know run some regression analysis. I think for that Excel uh, learning would, would would suffice. There are other softwares like Minitab, SAS, uh, which can also do the job for you. Uh, and in fact, SAS and Minitab and, uh, can also handle decent amounts of size of data. So it's not necessary to be a coder. But then if you are look specifically looking to become a data scientist, uh, then you know understanding uh, some of the programming languages uh, would be important. Again, not one person can do all of this, so you need to have a team, and, and that's where you essentially hire people who are also good at programming and coding. So hopefully that helps answer the question. Not necessary, but it will be good to know a little bit about it. Okay, one question before we move forward. There were multiple on this. Uh, how is data science different from business analytics? So uh, th there's a lot of uh, you know overlap between the two. I think uh, business analytics uh, will specifically, if you think about the way the program will be structured, right? It will it will teach you uh, about how data collection is important. It will teach you about uh, the business context about it. It will teach you uh, programming languages. It will teach you uh, also around uh, the different uh, you know modeling techniques, and then eventually uh, you'll also learn about pricing analytics, forecasting analytics. Uh, consumer analytics. So I think the business analytics as, as a whole uh, has a lot of uh, different aspects to it. Uh, data science, I would say, is 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 a core entity of that. So if you would if you were to draw some uh, uh, you know a subset, 
I would say business analytics is probably the universal set. It covers everything, and data science would be a subset of that. So that's how I would sort of you know define the two or differentiate between the two. Um, I think we can hold on to the rest of the questions for later. Thank you, Vikram. Perfect. So uh, let's understand structure and unstructured data, right? Uh, uh, important for us to sort of figure out what, how how the two different. I think earlier company information typically look like structured data because you're getting it in the right format. Unstructured would be audio, video uh, information, or even emails. Uh, tweets to an extent, or maybe online comments, just verbatim text coming to you would, would, would be uh, would be unstructured. So, so that's essentially the difference. Um, what you can sort of format easily, uh, put them into you know rows and columns and, and analyze quickly with your Excel pivots, potentially structured. What you cannot put them into these uh, simple simplified databases is unstructured. Uh, uh, numbers, dates, uh, easier to deal with, structured. Uh, audio video files, like I said, unstructured, difficult to sort of deal with the, uh, you know, that's why it's unstructured. Uh, uh, funny enough, by, you know, Gartner says 20% uh, uh, of the data out there in the world is actually structured. And uh, coming to think of it, they're pretty right, right? A lot of the data that we see around us, a lot of the data which these technology companies are dealing with is actually unstructured, whether it's, uh, whether it's what you're watching on YouTube uh, uh, or Netflix, uh, uh, the email information, if you, if you want to extract something from there, or audio video, that's really what is the majority of the data out there. So unstructured data is actually the larger piece, uh, which is 80% of the information. They also require requires more storage uh, as compared to structured data, which is you know far easier to handle and deal with. So uh, sort of good to understand the difference because when you become a data scientist, there'll be different techniques that one will have to use when you're dealing with structured data as compared to when you're dealing with unstructured information. Uh, so let's understand the data science framework. Now that we have understood, uh, let's say, what data science is about, uh, what are the skill sets required, uh, what's the challenge with big data, uh, and what are the, uh, let's say, structured, unstructured, different types of data, how do we work with it? Right? What would a data scientist really do, or what would a data scientist team uh, what really follow? So in, in simple sense, uh, it follows the, the OSM framework. You obtain data, you gather data, right? You clean the data because the data which you're going to get is not necessarily going to be uh, you know, complete, not necessarily in the right format. Uh, uh, there would be some ambiguity in that information. So somebody will have clean it. Uh, you have a team which would analyze that data, you know, explore, uh, try to see what patterns that we can see in it. Uh, once we have sort of identified a few patterns, you then start to start to model the information. So you build your models, which will help uh, you to predict uh, what a consumer would would is most likely to do. And then once you see that your model is succeeding and you are seeing results uh, which which are fairly in sync with uh, the historical information, then you sort of productionize that data, and uh, that's when you start interpreting the results, right? So in simple terms, that's the framework. Uh, I like to add one more step here. I feel this framework is missing a step because obtaining, scrubbing, exploring, uh, modeling, interpreting, fantastic. I think the one piece which is missing here is 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 going back onto that Venn diagram is, is the business problem definition. So for me, uh, I actually think of it as step zero, which potentially is, is equally important and this could become a six stage uh, framework which is actually defining the problem, defining the business problem that you're trying to solve. Because if, if you don't do that, then it's just like I'm getting data and I'm running all these random tools to see and to draw insights. That's not really going to be helpful. You as a data scientist or as a data science team need to first understand what's the business problem that you're trying to solve for and then uh, use the right tools and techniques. So uh, I think this is a, a, a quote which a lot of people know. A problem well defined is a problem half solved. And that's why we need to you know, start with really defining the problem well and, and then moving forward with the framework. So let's talk about the core building blocks. It uh, essentially takes off from where the previous slide left. Uh, so, the, so this that you see on the top is the domain expertise, right? Where data science can at the moment can be used, whether it's banking, insurance, uh, you know, operations, healthcare, telecom, e-commerce. Uh, that's the business uh, domain exp uh, you know, expertise that, that comes into the mix. Uh, with that 
in, in uh, with you with, with that information at hand and you've understood the business problem then becomes what the data science team will actually do so here starts the first part the data extraction the data integrity check is the data really right uh, what are the different sources of information from where this information can be collected the data can be collected uh, what are the different data types like structured unstructured is it uh, uh, what's the format Right, the data transformation piece. How do I transform all that raw information into a format that can actually be used by my model? So that's where the the, the data piece begins, which again we'll cover a little bit ahead uh, on, on on who does what. But that's that's a critical part of uh, you know of what data science is all about. Uh, so this would typically be your data architecture team that will help set this up for you. Then comes the data science team, which would uh, or the data scientist. Uh, uh, who would essentially identify the uh, the analytics in it? Who would understand what the model should be? What uh, what sort of a model would really work on on this sort of data and this sort of a business problem? They would then need to validate that uh, that model, uh, and then eventually they would score uh, various models which they which they apply to understand uh, which really uh, you know uh, showcases what the consumer behavior is or what really replicates what the consumer is really doing. Uh, and then once your, your model has learned, right, that's when you productionize all that information. That's where AI and ML comes into. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, the model then starts self-learning as the data keeps uh, keeps getting delivered, and then you improve the product accordingly, right? And then of course the last bit is that you you analyze and you showcase all those in, in those beautiful dashboards, which the business can really consume and and and, and move forward with taking a business decision. Now, a uh, couple of things that we need to uh, sort of know, uh, model fitting, you know, so whenever you have a data set and you're trying to, uh, you know, work on this, you will always need to bifurcate the data, uh, right, into a training set and a validation set. So a training set typically is, is the larger piece. It covers the seasonality. It covers the, the largest duration of the data that you have, just to ensure that all uh, uh, potential uh, causes of variation are have been covered, and then you run your models on the training set. So once your training set gives you uh, a fair, uh, you know, idea uh, of what's happening, and you're and you're comfortable with what the training set is doing, uh, then you move that to your validation set. So you so you, let's say if you have 15 years of information, you know, of data, let, and and the stock market, the the stock market is the best example, right? How do you predict how a stock is going to go up or down? Right, that's, that's purely data analytics. They have the historical price movement uh, for the last uh, 30 years since, since the Sensex has been trading or, or maybe more. Uh, they probably would divide that into, let's say, 25, uh, 26 years worth of uh, training data set. And then on the last three, four years, they would want to validate if whatever model they have run for stock prediction, that is really working on the validation set. So what? So. The beauty is since you've already, you since you have broken the data into uh, into let's say twenty five and five years, uh, those five years of information is already with you, right? So that is what is used to validate uh, when you uh, do see the model for twenty five years and you extrapolate that for the balance five years, you will see the difference between what the model is predicting for those five years versus what actually happened in the five years of data, and then the difference is the error. So lower the error, better the model, better the model accuracy. And uh, hence you can predict stock price movements for the coming year, right? Or for the next decade or for the next, uh, uh, you know, five years. And that's how essentially uh, you, if any of you are, uh, you know, uh, you know, dabble with stocks, you get those predictions like what stock to buy, what stock not to buy. That's purely because of the analytics. People are forecasting uh, how the stock price is going to move. Uh, and uh, there are different types of errors which one should look at. Uh, so when you want to predict the accuracy, whether it's MAE, so that's the mean absolute error, uh, average error, uh, there's RMSE, which is a root mean square error, and then uh, the MAP is the mean absolute percentage error. So there are different ways and means of which you can predict accuracy. Uh, uh, generally, the, the root mean square and, and, and the MAP, which is the mean absolute percentage error, is used the most. Uh, MAP, of course, is uh, is scale independent because it's a percentage uh, in term, uh, right? And then over here, we'll try to explain a few tools uh, which can be used. So the data architecture piece, you know, typically 
uh, these would be some of the tools that that, that the people would be using. If you're if you're a data science uh, guy, if you you know if you're really working on on the modeling part of it, then you would work on R, Python, SAS, like I said. And if you're into the uh, the reporting and the visualization piece, you would be working on uh, Click View and Tableau. Now, exploratory analysis is essentially where your data comes in and you are uh, analyzing what what the data is telling you. Predictive is where you want to predict what a customer would do. So you have the raw data which tells you what consumer behavior is, how the consumer is behaving today. Uh, and with predictive, you want to predict what the consumer will do in the future. So uh, simple cases, let's say if you're buying anything on an e-commerce website, you are, you are, you are shown a recommendation. Uh, the idea by showing you that recommendation is if you click on it, uh, that gives a result at the back end which says whether the, so the reason why that recommendation came to you is because they're predicting whether you would, uh, whether you would actually go ahead and click or buy that product. And uh, so they are trying to see what the consumer could do. Whereas prescriptive is essentially what a consumer should do. So if you take the self-driving cars, for example, that's a case in point of prescriptive because essentially uh, the car would have to take the direction, uh, the right direction, right? So it's predicting basis on the traffic lights and the speed and et cetera, what the car really should do. So different applications, again, of data science, you can use it to predict. You can also uh, utilize it to decide uh, or uh, drive consumer behavior in the sense what a consumer should be doing. Uh, and the, the, the self-driving car essentially becomes an example of the difference between the two. So uh, these are the building blocks. Uh, uh, and as you will go through the various webinars, which uh, the other panelists will, will take you over the course of the next month or so, they will, of course, you know, dwell more into these topics. But I just wanted to give you an overview of the framework because this will set you up for, for some of those webinars, hopefully. Uh, so let's understand now that we have understood how the framework works and what are the different team roles and responsibilities. That, like, it's not it's not possible for one person to be able to do everything. Uh, so the data preparation piece is is who we call the data wrangler, right? Uh, this person is essentially uh, you know great at extracting all that information from where the data has been stored, uh, ensuring that the data is being delivered in the right format, and it's being put in a way that the data scientist can actually utilize and draw insights from. Then comes the data scientist who is utilizing that prepared data and then de developing models. And then comes the data communicator or the storyteller who essentially would be creating those visualizations and who would be creating those dashboards that will help the business take a, take a decision. Now, once the model is worked and you've understood that it's working, then comes the data engineer piece who, uh, you know, this person would probably be working in parallel to productionize and make this into a automated sort of a system. So the AI ML engineer and the data engineer essentially would be covering uh, that part where they'll help you scale uh, this model into an actual product, which we, which we see in today's world when we work on these different apps. So the data wrangler is somebody, like I said, data preparation, munging, uh, pretty much 50% of the work in analytics uh, law uh, from the 2014 article says is actually goes into setting up the data architecture. Right, uh, and then some of the uh, tools that one would be using are, you know, Google BigQuery. Uh, so Excel has a Power Query as well, and then NumPy, which is part of, uh, you know, Python, are also great tools that will help you munge and and prepare. Uh, data scientists, of course, will be working on, uh, should understand the business, should analyze and create those models and hypotheses, uh, understand statistics, and for that, R, Python, SAS, Apache Spark, uh, these are frameworks that should help you. Uh, R and Python, of course, uh, would require coding. Uh, if you are not that, uh, let's say, in case of, let's take my example, I was not so great at coding when I started out. Uh, maybe still I'm not, I'm still not that great at coding, but, but, but SAS is really helpful. Uh, they have actually developed a lot of uh, easy drop and drag uh, templates where you, if you know how the data is structured, they can, they can really do it for you. So, so there are already a lot of development, even in that space where, uh, folks who are not that great at coding can also work on big data and, and draw insights. The, the third part of the team, uh, like the data communicator piece, as I said, the storyteller uh, would be the one who would visualize data, understand how we can translate all those uh, great insights or uh, that, that have been shared by the data scientists and basically sell the story to the, to the business, right? Uh, eventually that's what we want to do. We want to take a call 
about what decision to make about a consumer or about a product by analyzing all that data. So if you just send it a big large Excel sheet or a big, uh, you know, regression analysis, if you run that, uh, a lot of the business leaders may not always know how to interpret that information. So to be able to communicate that in the right sense is equally important. And then you have Tableau, ClickView, uh, Power BI, which is a Microsoft application to help you in visualizing that information. Uh, I would highly recommend for you to uh, go in uh, YouTube, watch Hans Rosling. Uh, he is considered one of the greatest in data visualization. Uh, uh, and a beautiful quote from him, the world cannot be understood without numbers, but the world cannot be understood with numbers alone. So you need to visualize that information. And there's a, there's a beautiful video. In fact, there are several on YouTube. Uh, this is the link to the one that I recommend watching. Uh, I probably share this with you guys, uh, 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 and you could you can copy it. But if you just YouTube uh, his his name, uh, it'll probably be the first hit uh, that you see. It's a twenty minute video. Uh, uh, you would probably think, how can I watch a twenty minute video about data visualization? But 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 trust me, uh, two minutes in, you will realize what he's doing there. Uh, he's shown fifty years worth of information on uh, on on various countries' growth uh, in a very very beautiful way uh, through using Tableau. And uh, you know you will get hooked on to data visualization once once you watch him. I certainly did, and I strongly recommend you to go and uh, Google Hans Rosling and, and and watch his videos. Uh, then comes the data engineer piece, which, like I said, uh, they're the ones who are converting those mod models into final data products, and uh, they are great with, with with the database systems, right? Because all that data needs to be stored and it needs to continuously uh, update itself. So whether it's the AWS, it's SQL, it's Microsoft Azure. Hadoop, these are some of the tools that one can uh, one can you know learn more about if data engineer is, is, is where you find your, your skills. So the idea is that you need to find out what what's in it for you, where where you find yourself uh, best suited for, and then take that forward in your journey as a data science scientist or as a you know business analytics uh, uh, program uh, as as you go through that. So uh, I think Shabila, we can take some questions because after this I have just uh, some examples case studies uh, so if there are any questions sure. regarding the content yeah. we can um, absolutely uh, so this was a question from the uh, first part of the session vikram uh, consumers give their data for free by signing up on free apps uh, but is there a choice if you want to use that app we have to agree to those terms so what is your view on that yeah, I think, uh, you know, very well put, uh, sometimes we don't have the choice, I think, but, but I also feel a large amount of time. We don't read all those terms and conditions. Well, uh, there could be certain apps uh, that do give you the option to opt out. Uh, but I think in our, in our haste, we just, you know, check mark everything and, and, and we accept it. So the idea here is to, to make you mindful of what people are doing with your data and then, uh, you really need to ask yourself whether all those apps that you have on your on your phone, whether you really need them, and then those where you are sort of drawing uh, the right use from makes sense. Go ahead, use them because we don't really have a choice. But then there are potentially a lot of them, which which we just download for for trials. Maybe we use it once, we forget about it, but they continue to have access to your information. And then some of there are some apps that actually ask you for uh, you know for access to your photographs, for your uh, for your uh, messages. Uh, for your call logs, uh, maybe some of those apps really, really don't don't need it. And there are, I think, today with data security and data data privacy, there's a lot of work happening in that field. And I, and, I, and I'm sure that, and I've seen them on the iPhone as well. If you go, there are uh, there are ways and means by which you can block certain information which these apps have access to. So uh, data privacy in itself has become a big field today, and there's a lot of work being done there. So. Uh, you'll be surprised to see if you really go into your settings and, and check what accesses you provide. There could be a lot of apps which are uh, probably have access to a lot of information which they really don't need. And uh, today, I think there is an option to opt out to at least some of them, if not all. So, yeah. Okay. Next question would, uh, and I'm going by uh, the ones that have been voted up. Uh, in terms of which questions I'm going after. So, would Python take over? Uh, Art language as the major programming language required to become a good data scientist. Yeah, I, I think again a great question. There are there are a lot of uh, people out there who have their views about Python and R. Uh, if you are a, if you are a, a uh, if you're not so comfortable with coding, I would recommend uh, to start with R. 
uh, because I, f I found it myself more easy to, to learn and deal with. Uh, if you have a good enough knowledge about Java and you have prior experience of coding, maybe you could Maybe you could start. Maybe you could, you could directly go into Python as well and learn about it. But uh, uh, will Python take over R? I think each of them have their own benefits. Uh, I, I see it from the from the aspect of who's really using it, right? If you are a great coder already, yeah, by all means, Python makes makes sense. And then you know maybe five years on the line, there'll be a different uh, uh, scripting language which will which will be ruling the roost. So uh, difficult to say what's going to rule the world in five years down the line. But yeah, I think it all depends upon how comfortable you are. And, and how much information and knowledge you have about uh, about the language. If you are uh, great at it already, please go ahead and start with Python. If not, if you are somebody like me who is starting out for the first time with programming, uh, I would recommend still to start with R. And then slowly build up your appetite. If you if after R you feel yes, you are willing to take up the next step of getting into Python, yes, go there. If you if you're not so comfortable, then maybe use SAS or other of these uh, tools out there which can. Essentially, help you with drag and drop functionalities to draw insights. So, hopefully, that helps answer that question. Okay, thank you. So, what list of courses would you suggest for beginners in the field of data science? Uh, right. I think uh, uh, if you have a great uh, working knowledge already about maths and stats, uh, I think when you're then you're, then you're already on, on your path. But if not, I would recommend to start with some fundamentals about statistics. Uh, start learning about it uh, uh, just to get uh, you know get, get things rolling. Uh, start learning a bit about R and Python by at least R. Uh, so these are all open source. So you don't you don't really don't have to pay to download the R application or the Python application. You can download them on your systems. Uh, these are open source, of course. Uh, and there are a great amount of YouTube videos that actually help you start with R. I can recommend a few books to you as well. Uh, you know how I started my journey, and maybe uh, you know after this uh, uh, session is over, I can share those with, uh, with with the faculty here, and they can help share it with with the team. But I would say uh, start with uh, reading about R, uh, watch your YouTube videos, start getting a bit of knowledge about statistics, refresh if you have already done it in the past. Uh, I think those are other core fundamentals. Because anything else after that, uh, uh, if you have your building blocks in place, right, then learning the rest of the course is, is really not that difficult. So I would still say start with the building blocks and then build from there. Great. Uh, how do I go about applying for a data scientist or a data analyst internship? And what are the bare minimum level of skills that are required? Yeah, I think uh, uh, so. So this is a bit tricky to answer because uh, it all depends upon uh, you know what one has experience with. But I would say uh, start start to try to find a business analyst role. I think uh, a lot of my batchmates as well, uh, even from ISB. Uh, so the ISB batch had had people people with ten years of experience, uh, maybe five six years as a business analyst. There were some who were just starting out. There were some like me who had who had never done programming as essentially before, but had handled statistics and, and data. So uh, I would say try to look for internships uh, with as a business analyst. I think that would be a good starting point or or as a good starting role. It will get you comfortable with data. It will get you comfortable with uh, uh, with drawing insights, right? And then as you build from there, and as you build your uh, uh, build your knowledge around, uh, you know, around statistics and and around programming. You can and data visualization. That's how you take a step up. Uh, like I said, there, there's there's a there's a shortage of data scientists, right? There there are a lot more people who are who are wanting data scientists as compared to people who have the skill set. So finding a job essentially in, in a data science profile will not be difficult if you if you uh, you know tap the right uh, you know right doors. Uh, but like I said, I mean. Um, Get get the basics in place, and then start looking for for business analyst roles. Uh, and then essentially, I think the alumni network of, of bits in itself uh, would be very helpful. I think all of us uh, who have uh, you know been in this field for a while, I think we have built that uh, that network to an extent. Uh, and there are a lot of job postings uh, that that we are aware of, uh, which we can help uh, share with you guys. 
uh, also uh, you know join the different data science groups that are there on LinkedIn. I think there's a lot of information flowing there as well around what people are looking for. So uh, the opportunity is, is 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 there. I mean, just the shortage of data science as I, scientists as I showed you on the previous slide should help you understand that th there is a lot of uh, potential out there. You just need to upskill yourself a little bit to and get into a business analyst role and then build from there. Uh, one more question: uh, Everything is being replaced or automated. Will the data, uh, will the role of a data scientist be replaced? And if yes, I think so, you know, great question. <laughs> yeah, great question. Uh, uh, I still feel we're a little little far out from that happening, but I, I think with the way AI and ML is taking over, uh, taking over the world, uh, uh, potentially uh, possible. But I still feel that uh, you know the one area why why you would still need a data scientist or you would still need uh, people is the business problem understanding. I, I Like the computer skills can probably take care of itself with the computing power, with all the technologies that we have in the world. The maths and science, the, the maths and uh, statistics knowledge, I think that computers have already learned. Uh, but the one piece at the moment, which is still is still not uh, being solved by uh, by computers themselves, is to be able to see a problem, uh, see a business problem and attack it, right? Uh, you've always had to give that uh, that direction a little bit to uh, uh, to these different models. And I think that piece at the moment is uh, we have not found a way to automate that or or uh, sort of replicate replicate that. Once that happens, I'm, I'm pretty confident that the data scientist role also could be could be eliminated. But until that time, hopefully, uh, you know, we we will continue to uh, at least have the data science as, as the field still grow. And also uh, you know, the jobs uh, as well. Great. Uh, maybe we stop there with the question answer session uh, questions. And uh, Avikram, why don't you go ahead with your slides for now? Perfect. So uh, the next few slides, uh, uh, everyone, these are just applications of uh, the different tools. Right. I'm not getting into the detailed modeling behind it, but the idea here is to generate interest in you guys about the subject and how there are companies out there who are using uh, data science or, or different aspects of data science uh, to really enhance their business. So I'm going to start with uh, with, with one of uh, could be controversial in the sense that uh, you know people have opinions about this topic, but uh, it's great to understand how people are, how you know media networks are actually using data to to, to write viewership. So uh, this is an example of data visualization actually helping increase viewership for a for a media channel. So as you're aware, right, the general election, the election in India is, is is always talked about. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has their favorite party. Everybody has, uh, you know, their thoughts about how the government is faring or they're not faring, right? But but essentially, for these big media houses, just imagine there are so many 300, you know, political parties, so many candidates, so many polling booths, uh, 21,000 odd votes uh, counter, uh, you know, live streaming or results happen each second. Uh, that's a big data problem in itself, but for these media houses, this is an opportunity, right? Uh, if they're able to tap into more viewership, then essentially you can have more people partnering with them uh, for ads, and then therefore more revenue. So how do you, how do these media organizations ensure that they keep uh, the viewer hooked uh, to their particular channel? I mean, we all have preferences of what we want to watch. Uh, I know that, but then how do you keep the guy? How do you keep uh, uh, the people engaged? Right, and that's where data visualization in uh, in, in this year uh, and in the past has really helped some of these media companies, you know, improve. So these are some snapshots of how one of these media channels really used data visualization to showcase to the audiences how, let's say, the election, election results have changed from 14 to 19, how the parties are faring at different times of the day. So, you know, if you see this column over here, this uh, bar over here, you will see they have actually shown over a period of time from 8 in the morning to, let's say, 12 in the afternoon, uh, how the different parties uh, are seeing, uh, you know, trends happening with data, uh, where the leads are narrow, where there's a significant amount of lead, uh, so all of that essentially, you know, engages the the viewer or the consumer, and then how a particular state has changed over the period of time. So the idea here is the the better the visualization, the the more uh, the viewer is sort of hooked onto it, 
and uh, therefore more opportunity for these media houses to uh, you know rake in ads and then basically you know drive uh, drive more more revenue so uh, actually this particular example this media house uh, you know reported that uh, because of the use of data visualization they were able to record about 122 combined million watch minutes on counting day and that helped improve their viewership uh, by over 100% from weekly impressions of you know 0.6 million viewers or half million viewers uh, to about 1.4 million viewers so uh, now people would not realize that right that's, that's happening at the background but there is uh, a, a very well known data visualization firm uh, which has done uh, elections in the past uh, and also suppose some of the elections in the us that actually help build this data visualization and imagine there are so many data uh, so many results coming out from these various polling booths that is being put into the systems that data is being captured and then you know uh, live refresh of the data is happening so, so there's a big data science happening even behind uh, you know when we watch election results and we just don't know it but hopefully now you know like how those graphics are being are being presented there is live refresh happening of information which is then being fed in which has been taken from the election website from these polling booths and then basis that the viewer sees what he does see so that's one example uh, i'm going to you know share another example of an nbfc which is a non banking financial uh, uh, corporation uh, which has become a monopoly in today's today's uh, this is an indian uh, monopoly by the way uh, uh, so essentially how does a how does the nbfc make money right they make they they lend the operations is that they lend money but how do they make money they make money by understanding uh, you know the if you are able to lend to a to a credit worthy a, a good credit customer then the chances of him paying back are high and therefore you don't you don't have npas or non performing assets and therefore the, the the customer who takes the loan pays an interest and he pays back that money that's how an nbfc essentially makes money right uh, those that become bad credit or bad debt uh, that money is never coming back so if you're able to create a large divide between the good credit customers and the bad credit customers uh, where of course your proportion of good credit is is more uh, you would end up making money and you, you you would you would say in the business if you if you can't do that then you would essentially default and uh, there'll come a point in time when your assets will when it will become an nta and then those loans and then you probably go you know, go bankrupt so that's essentially the the, the, the thought behind an nbfc now uh, these N, so the nbfc in particular that i'm talking about uh, they realized uh, very early that data science is the future right and they began collecting uh, data about the 400 million affluent indians from 2008 to 2016 so about 8 to 9 years of, of data they they uh, ensured that they were able to collect information how they did it is in the link that i've given you at the bottom there is a there's a there's a site called credit vidya which will explain to you how your sms's are being read and that's essentially what i talked about right? we are giving up our data for free we don't even realize it and there are apps that are reading our information and then that's being sold in the market so credit vidya will 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 explain to you how it really works uh, uh, right and, and essentially as you read off your sms's uh, uh, through the various apps that you download that information then filters back uh, you know, to these NBFCs as well. Now, once assuming that this information has been collected, like they have the app and people have given up their data, like 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 you and I probably have, uh, what do they do with that data, right? So that comes a place where where they start creating a risk, uh, a pool of you know low risk self employed borrowers. So what this organization essentially did was they tried to attack uh, you know self employed borrowers. Uh, which at that particular point in time in the market was considered to be high risk because if you are if you have a if you have a monthly salary coming in, you are considered lower risk because uh, there is a monthly income coming through, right? But self-employed people, uh, uh, because it's, it's a business and uh, uh, sometimes the business can be up, can, can be down. Uh, they were thought back in those times in 2008, 2006 that they are probably slightly higher risk, so they were never tapped as a market. This NBFC. Uh, decided that with that data which is coming through, right? Let's try to target what sort of self-employed, uh, you know, uh, people uh, or borrowers are actually low risk. So they realize that doctors and dentists are actually a pretty good uh, uh, area to look at because uh, you, know, doc you know people will keep falling sick. You will need to go to a doctor, uh, and therefore uh, that's a steady income which a which a which a doctor can really have, and therefore. Uh, that could be a good pool of you know customers to sort of target. 
Now, uh, as that data got collected, you know, they went ahead, uh, they collected information, like I said, for those 400 million affluent Indians, uh, they then built clusters or let's say buckets. So they bucketize these information of these doctors uh, and they use factors like what's the university from where this doctor is, is he an AIMS uh, doctor or is he from a tier two or a tier three university? Uh, is that doctor an oncologist or is he a cosmetic or, or a, is that doctor a cosmetic surgeon? Uh, where does this doctor have his, uh, his or her clinic? Is it based in Nanderi, which is considered to be, let's say, uh, a, a highly, or let's say, a more affluent uh, location to have a clinic as compared to, let's say, Navi Mumbai, right? Uh, so, based on multiple such factors, they clustered uh, the information of uh, doctors that they had. And essentially, what they were able to do with this was uh, those uh, customers who were borrowers who had. Uh, who had a better, let's say, uh, fit in the sense, lower risk, they, let's say a university, an AIMS doctor uh, who's an oncologist and has a clinic in Andheri will be probably bucketed at, at the lowest risk, right? Because he or she will have a potentially great source of income coming through versus, let's say, a tier two or a tier three university doctor uh, who's a cosmetic surgeon from Navi Mumbai, uh, he or she could be, let's say, a slightly higher risk. So if they're able to bucketize these doctors, they can actually give them differential interest rates, right? So the uh, the best in class or the lowest risk will get the the lowest uh, uh, interest rate uh, because essentially the risk is low, right? And, and it's also the better propensity for that for that customer to use as compared to where the risk is high. And if the risk is high, of course, the interest rate, of course, at the same time goes up because uh, there is a risk associated with that with that borrow. Right, so that's what they were able to differentiate. They were able to give uh, the low risk customers better interest rates, and of course, the higher risk customers uh, got uh, got sli slightly higher uh, interest uh, rates to deal with. Now, what's the competitive advantage that they've built with this? So we call it a moat. Uh, right, the moat uh, is essentially so. If you think about like in the literal sense, if you have a castle and then you have this big pond around you. It makes it almost difficult for anybody to attack you, right? Because that that's essentially what what a moat means. But in a in a business context, because of that power of data that you have, you have built you have, you have built such a strong um, let's say differentiation among uh, you know amongst these customers that you have. That will be very difficult for a new NBFC to be able to uh, to break break through. Now, if a new NBFC actually had to break through, what would they do? Right? They would if they have to tap into the market, they would start with an average interest rate because they really don't have that data, right? They don't know who's a good customer, who's not a good customer. So they would tap in with an average interest rate. Now, what will happen by offering an average interest rate? The, uh, the high credit risk customers who are, uh, who are getting a higher interest rate at that NBFC would generally levitate towards the new NBFC because for them, that average interest rate will be will be lower than what this NBFC is offering. Uh, what that will do in a sense is it will purify the loan book of this NBFC. So this NBFC, which is the leading NBFC in India, will end up having only the, the good quality customers with the lowest risk. And all the bad quality customers, essentially, potentially bad quality customers, would move to the new NBFC. So they have purified their, their loan book and therefore uh, it, it further, you know, stabilizes them in the market because the new NBFC then would have would have trouble with those uh, high risk customers who could become NTAs, which potentially could not be the case with, with this NBFC. Now, this NBFC in 2015-16, uh, they actually then, after they had done the doctors and the lawyers of the world uh, of India, then they moved towards the next line of, uh, they attacked the next line of customers. They tied up with these high street retailers, the Chromas, the Vijay sales of the world. And uh, what they did there was, they set up their kiosk and said that, okay, if a consumer is coming to buy these electronic items, we will finance the loan. So for the uh, retailer, it makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, a customer who walks in, who doesn't have that money at hand, can actually buy, who can take that from the NBFC and the product can be bought. So increased sales for the retailers. Uh, the differentiation that, uh, that this NBFC had was because they had so much amount of data, they were able to churn out your credit worthiness in two minutes as compared to competition, which would have to take two plus days to actually come around with an answer. And that essentially was the moat, right? That's the competitive advantage. And, and essentially at zero cost of customer acquisition, 
right? They have grabbed the best customers and now they can cross sell you everything. So now that you've taken this loan to buy, uh, you know, buy a new smartphone and you are a good customer, you're paying back your loan. They already have that information. You will then start getting those calls. Why do you take a personal loan? Why do you take a car loan? Why do you take a home loan? That's all happening because there's a huge amount of data science taking place at the back end. So if you get that call, a pesky call, right, from a from a from a representative who's saying, "Why do you take a loan today?" Uh, you're getting that call because some way your information has been modeled at the back end, and uh, you are potentially a credit worthy customer, which is why they're reaching out to you. So hopefully, you you get a flavor of how. Uh, you know, the NBFCs are using uh, data science to, to work through. Uh, I just wanted to pause here and just check uh, in terms of time, uh, uh, how much would we have uh, Nito Sharmila? Because I have a few more examples. I can probably curtail them just to be able to uh, just be respectful about the time that we have. I do have a hard stop in 20 minutes, but I think uh, Professor Neetu, uh, how long do we have this session for? Yeah, yeah, Vikram, I think you can take 15 more minutes and then we can have the final q and I think that would that work? Perfect, perfect. That's absolutely fine. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, I'll cover one more example and then I'll probably move into a case study from, uh, from my own uh, bit. And there are a couple of more uh, examples in this deck. Maybe we can, uh, we can share that separately with, uh, with the team uh, and, and you guys can read through that. And if you have any questions, I'll be able to, happy to take them even later on. So let's understand how, uh, you know, the e-commerce industry is using your information. So every time you go on to the e-commerce website uh, and, you, and you click a button or you search or you add a product to cart, uh, or you complete or you don't complete that transaction or what you rate the product, that's all being stored. So every action that you're doing at these e-commerce websites by searching, by adding to cart, by, by rating, all of that is getting tracked at the back end, right? Uh, and again, that's, that's, that's building the, the database for them. Uh, now, traditionally, if you were in a store and you were buying a product, uh, you know, the salesperson over there would try to cross sell you or upsell you something. So if you're looking for, let's say a mobile phone, uh, they would try to upsell you a, a, a higher or a, or a better uh, you know, version of that same phone, which is upselling of course. And then cross selling is if you're buying, buying a new, uh, let's say iPhone, then probably also you know, try to get you a, a speaker or, or a Bose headset along with it. So that's, that's of course cross selling. Now, because you're not in a store uh, and you don't have that salesman or salesperson there, how does an e-commerce website really cross sell and upsell? At the end of the day, uh, they also want to maximize their revenue, right? They want to uh, show you more opportunities of what you could buy. And that's essentially where data science plays a role. Bases on your user behavior, uh, they have what, what we have in data science called as built recommendation engines. So uh, what does that actually mean? So there are different types of uh, approaches. One is uh, user-based collaborative filtering, one is item-based collaborative filtering, one is hybrid filtering. So let's understand uh, the two. Uh, so user-based is uh, like if I am customer X and I have bought uh, product A, B, and C, uh, and then there's a customer uh, Y out there, let's say who has bought A, B, C, and D. So you would see three items are common between the two. So basis that commonality the recommendation engine, as it's capturing all that information and, and we are buying similar products, it would start recommending D to me, right? So because X has not bought D, but then A, B, and C are similar to what Y has bought, they will start recommending D to X. That is why when you buy something on these e-commerce websites, you will also see at the bottom, there's a recommendation being made. You know, this goes well with this. That's essentially because information is being stored at the back end, there's data science happening, and then people are pitching that product to you. Then comes the item based approach. So uh, let's say you've bought, uh, uh, you know, different uh, flavors of, let's say chocolate, the very versions of chocolate ice cream you bought, uh, right? Now, based on your his, his, history of buying ice creams, the system will try to also push you a different flavor ice cream. So maybe an ice cream is not the best example for, for an e-commerce uh, example, but just, just think about it, right? You're, you're buying, uh, and classic example is when I had my son, uh, uh, about a year, uh, two years back, actually, uh, we were looking for buying, uh, you know, all those uh, items that, that one would need, the diapers, uh, the pram, et cetera, from these e-commerce websites. And, and based on what I was searching, like right, the brands I was searching, 
they started pushing different products. If I bought something, let's say from, uh, I don't know how many of you probably, uh, you, know, you guys would not know about all of this, but uh, the different brands out there, like Mama Earth, all of these are brands which would sell uh, child-based, let's say, product. And uh, uh, you know, if you're if you're searching for those, they will then you know push to you maybe a love lap, which is also a brand. So that's essentially an item base. It is looking at my item uh, item search history, item purchase history, and then recommending me similar sort of products uh, for me to buy. And that's essentially what the recommendation engine is working on. It's capturing all that information that you, me. Uh, Everybody that we know, go and search, add to cart, maybe not even buy it, but what we are watching, clicking, all of that information is getting stored at the back end. And then from there, the recommendation engines are again segmenting customers who are similar in nature, looking at uh, purchased uh, behaviors, and they're essentially recommending products. Like this example, uh, this hopefully the snapshot essentially explains the same thing. Uh, uh, Tim has bought all these items. John has bought... Uh, uh, has bought two of the items. So then because Tim has bought two other items, you can push that as user based. In this example, John bought an ice cream. There's another ice cream, which is potentially uh, that can be pushed. So then you're pushing a separate ice cream to John, which is item based collaborative thinking. And then a hybrid model actually intertwines both of them and works on it. So, so that's about how cross selling happens through recommendations. And again, data science is at, is at the back. Um, this is an example of, of mobility. Uh, uh, I will not cover this in the interest of time, but then maybe we can share it later with all of you. And you can read about it. Uh, uh, I will cover this last example with a case study uh, and, and that should help us wrap up. So you're all aware uh, of every company wants to improve margins, right? And then uh, since we have a lot of data database available, available online of what consumers are reviewing about product, that also helps uh, maximize revenue and also increase margins for, for anybody, for, for, a, for a retailer. Uh, and this is a you know small example of what explains how the number of reviews per product actually help uh, lift the order number of orders that people place. So if you, if you and I are buying something online, if that particular product has very low reviews, we potentially don't trust it. But if there's a product out there which has a thousand reviews and a four and a half star rating, our trust increases, and we go ahead and probably make the purchase. So that's essentially how important uh, reviews are. Uh, especially online, and that triggers sales. Now, what happens is that if the star ratings along with these reviews are not in sync, then you would not essentially go ahead and buy the product, right? So the conversions will drop. If the conversions will drop, and let's say if customers really buy, those customers who have bought the product and returned it, so then uh, costs go up because you have to return it. Uh, you have to have the reverse logistics in place to pick up that damaged product, and then that impacts your that impacts a retailer's margin, right? So while we want to increase rev uh, reviews, you also want to have good ratings because if you don't have good ratings, then the margins drop as costs increase, right? Which is a classic case of what happens today when you return a product. Now, as a team of data scientists or as a team that's working on looking at these reviews, uh, what can we do to support the business? So we want to improve customer experience for sure. We want to have every product highly star rated. Uh, but then we potentially cannot read every review. Like if there are a thousand reviews, my team and I will not be working on one, one SKU only, right? SKU is a stock keeping unit. We cannot work on one product only. We'll, have, we'll be working on multiple products. So we need some sort of data science uh, tool to help us uh, understand this, this information. And that is where text analytics and natural language processing, NLP, uh, actually come, come in handy because they help in derive meaning from this, from this database which is out there. So essentially in text analytics, you have uh, a dictionary of known words, right? Uh, the text analytics assigns, uh, as it reads every comment, it, uh, it, it, it matches it with its dictionary, which is, which is kind of stored uh, as you uh, load different packages through R, Python, and these tools. Uh, you put a frequency to how frequently a term is get, a word is getting repeated, right? And then you also look at uh, how frequent is it in terms of uh, the overall, uh, let's say, feedback. So now typically there are filler words when you start building a conversation, the does, the er, the a's, right? They potentially repeat more. So we can't give a lot of weightage to the does essentially, right? Because they'll repeat, uh, you know, more in, in, a, in a conversation. But then the, uh, uh, you know, using text analytics, you also associate 
uh, a weightage to how rarely a word is being is being uh, witnessed in a in a paragraph or, or in a context. So, for example, if somebody says this was damaged, right? The damage would be occurring uh, far less frequently, essentially, as compared to the other words. So, a combination of the frequency and a combination of the weightage uh, uh, gives us uh, what today we develop as uh, cloud. Uh, sorry, word cloud and uh, sentiment analysis. So uh, what we've also done with text analytics is that uh, every bag of words also has a sentiment associated to it. So if it's a positive sentiment, like easy installation will be a positive sentiment as compared to where somebody has said doesn't work will be a negative sentiment. So as you text, where you do text analytics, you are able to break down that verbatim thousand uh, comments that consumers have left and actually create a word cloud that gives you the the most important words to to look at like in this particular case a broken handle for a particular product was, was showing up uh, and then you also get a, a frequency in terms of percentage of how how frequently it's coming up and then you get the sentiment behind it. this actually helps you to identify the problem where you really want to get in and and really solve it so that's how text analytics is handy i will Quickly run through you one example from my own uh, space. We were working on a product, uh, one of the products, which was an organizer storage box like this, uh, right? And we saw increasing trend for the customer returns. So as you see, the the red line just continues to go up. Uh, the bars are the sales. The blue line is the damages. Uh, the uh, yellowish orange line is uh, the the returns, and then the accumulation of these two is the is the RTV plus damage. Right, RTV is nothing but return to vendor. So, what proportion of your sales is getting returned by customers? Markdown is what proportion of your sales is getting uh, discounted or marked down in, in the store, and then a combination of those two can be about the the RTV and damage. Where did we apply data science? Uh, so, we work in the operation excellence and the quality assurance space. We uh, could not have gone through all those comments, so we built the data science model, the text analytics model that actually came up with. Uh, what are those key words that are coming up? So broken handle, broken deal for this uh, storage uh, uh, system were coming up more frequently. Uh, so that essentially helped us how to uh, utilize our time more on the on the investigation on how can we fix this problem rather than actually spend time reading those comments and then understanding where to work. So that's the power of data science. It gave us direction. When we got the direction, it was easy, right? We worked with the manufacturer. We did a lot of tests. We did root cause identification on why the handle is breaking, why the wheel is breaking. We did uh, all our protocol tests for the product, right? And we actually saw that there were some issues. Uh, we, the wheels were, were, were not really meeting the test requirements that, that we had set up. Uh, so that essentially, the data science piece helped us reduce time because we could quickly turn around and actually help on improving the product rather than actually spend time and reading comments. We were able to quickly identify the problem and get into solving for it. The next step, of course, was to build solutions, which we did. So we actually had the supplier build a hundred percent automation on on the wheel testing. So I'll show you that in a quick uh, uh, video. This is how. So uh, we were able to actually, uh, you know, find the issue, solve for it, and, and and put a control check in place, which will ensure no other customer now would get a product that is that is not inspected or not. Uh, so we pause that video. There were some issues around, uh, you know, the latch. So we built solutions for the latch as well as we worked with the team. Uh, no go go gauge, which helped, uh, you know, ensure that defective product will not make it through our uh, our inspection process. And then essentially, once we implemented all those actions, we saw how the product started improving. So what you see here is the RTV damage rate reducing uh, from a peak of about 4.33%. It actually came down to about 1.49% uh, uh, by the end of February. This is the latest data. And through this, we have been able to deliver to the business an annualized savings of about $120,000. This is just one skew. That's the power of data science. You can invest your time on the right things uh, and the data science piece actually helps you, uh, you know, move forward in the right direction. So uh, the last bit, the takeaways, data science is here to stay, guys. Uh, pattern mining, consumer segmentation uh, is probably what's going to drive uh, the growth in the next decade. As business leaders, one needs to be completely abreast with new technologies. Uh, so, so please look at data science. I, 
excited to see that, that the interest is there. Think of it as a toolbox, uh, right? And 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 uh, learn which tool to use where, of course. And like I said at the end, in God we trust. All others must bring data. So hopefully through this, I've been able to uh, develop that interest in you about data science, and uh, uh, you know, have been able to share a few insights from my own journey about uh, about becoming a data scientist. So. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, can I get a presentation right here? Thank you for that very informative uh, discussion on data sciences. I quickly wanted to cover two topics before we go to the last set of uh, questions. Uh, can I get the presentation? So I have uh, uh, provided a uh, in the chat. Uh, I've provided a Google form that uh, uh, if you could, uh, if all the attendees could click on that form and provide feedback, that would be very helpful for us. And I also quickly wanted to cover uh, next uh, the next set of series that we will be uh, uh, presenting. Um, so uh, next week we have uh, Ajay Gumari, who is a product leader at Google, uh, who will be talking about uh, how they use uh, uh, business analytics and data analytics. And uh, after that, it will be Harsha Kunduri on 2nd April. So please do attend those sessions. Again, uh, please provide your feedback for today's lecture through the link apps uh, shared through chat. That will be very helpful. Uh, and we also do have a surprise uh, 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 offer. Uh, and Vikram has very kindly uh, 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 agreed to provide a bonus session to the top three performers of the evaluation that you will be going through today. So uh, Vikram, thank you again uh, for uh, your kind offer. I think the students will find it very, very helpful. So with that, I think we've come to the end of the presentation, but let's look at the questions uh, on Slido. Uh, maybe we can take one or two questions and uh, 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 end the session. Sh yes. Sorry to interrupt. So we can't see the uh, feedback uh, URL in the chat. Can you just put it again? Um, all right. I'll I put it in the chat to everyone uh, at 649, uh, but. Uh, uh, we, we can't see it. We can't see it. Can you do it again, please? Yeah, I'm doing that again. Uh, and also I'll put it in the Q&A session. Uh, and Professor Neetu, if it doesn't show up, uh, um, I can send it by email later. Yes. Uh, will you be uh, able to share okay. it with the students? Okay, okay, okay. Just a minute. Yeah. Yes. So, in terms of questions, uh, Vikram, uh, let's uh, take one or two and uh, uh, end the session. So, how difficult is it to learn business analytics for a fresher? And what advice would you give to business analytics aspirants who are not familiar with coding or tech stuff? I think uh, see, I would always, I would like you guys to sort of draw inspiration from 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 somebody like me who does who do not like programming, right? Uh, uh, I would say st start small uh, uh, and and then uh, you know build from there. Uh, I think to start with business analytics, uh, start with data. I'll try to understand uh, how data, how what you know, data in terms of business analytics, uh, data statistics. Uh, try to get uh, get yourself uh, you know more familiar with uh, with statistics. Learn uh, about statistics as well. I have some uh, good references which I will, which I can share with you around around books uh, and YouTube videos that that can help you uh, in your journey. As far as programming goes, uh, like I said, R is, uh, is is a fantastic tool to start with. However much it might be uh, slowly getting dwarfed by some of the other uh, tools out there. I think for a non coder. 
uh, like me, uh, I found it probably the easiest thing to start learning. Uh, so start with that. Um, uh, so those are two aspects which you which you can easily pick up and, and learn yourself. Uh, I think the business piece and the business context will come with experience. It's probably hard to uh, to 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 you know uh, just pick that up right away. Hopefully uh, through your MBA program. Uh, uh, there would be a lot of insights already shared with you, case studies already shared with you, so you would have a fair idea of, of how to think about a business problem. But uh, essentially, when you will get into the workforce and you start, uh, you know, uh, uh, your uh, your journey, you will then start seeing uh, the business side of it will also enhance. So I think it's a combination of the three. But but typically for for business analytics, start with the basics, the fundamentals. Learn about statistics. Learn about uh, programming of R. Uh, through through YouTube, through some of the books that I can recommend, and I think that that will that will set you up for for success. Great, thank you, Vikram. One final question: uh, What are the final uh, different technologies that you're currently working on, and what are must-know technologies for the current industry as a data scientist? Yeah. What all are we working on? Uh, so I shared with you an example today of how we used uh, data which consumers had already sort of give, you know, put in, uh, drew insights from there, and uh, moved towards uh, you know, solving a problem. We are essentially moving towards uh, uh, you know, we're significantly using machine learning. So how can we actually uh, predict uh, before this really becomes a problem, before we really start seeing that rising trend of returns? How can we really predict, uh, you know, about about the products, uh, you know? So that's essentially where we, where as an industry, at least the retail space is moving towards. Uh, in a function like quality, we want to ensure that we are able to predict the right product. Uh, can we build the right sensors, let's say, in the manufacturing process itself, uh, that can give us insights when a particular product is, let's say, going off spec and uh, kill the issue. Uh, at you know at, at the starting phase before it actually ships to the store a customer buys it and then he returns he or she returns it and, and then we work on it how can we build all that ai ml right at the at the production site so that's essentially what we are working on uh, and this is an evolving space so particularly for us we have built something called as an early warning system which gives us uh, a three month sort of flavor of what consumers are saying so before we actually monitor and start, let's say, an initiative over 12 months of data. Can we quickly see within three months of, of information whether the product is going off spec or not and actually solve the problem early? So that's essentially where, as a retail space specifically for quality, where we are working on. And then the, the other bit is getting into IoT, the Internet of Things, by building all those sensors and, and data compatibility right at the factory, the manufacturer uh, source, to prevent the product from actually going off spec in the first place. Uh, the first place. So that's essentially what we are at the moment working on. Great. Thank you so much, Vikram. I guess uh, let me end the questions there. Uh, Professor Barai, uh, would you like to uh, uh, say in, uh, a few words before we end the session? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sharmila. I think um, Vikram has set the, 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 the ball rolling, and I'm really uh, very, very happy. Someone who has shown tremendous passion and the kind of an energy you had uh, of your this talk, uh, I, I could see myself maybe 20 years back in that energy level. And that was something very remarkable again. And it is, it is indeed very, very good and very enhanced actually. Um, you gave the idea about the basics and the overview and then the, taking into the case studies and then finally demonstrating with the real life example which you have been doing it. And uh, that experience counts a lot. And um, Sharmila, thank you so much for giving that surprise element that the top performers are going to have a chance to interact with Vikram. This is something which is, I'm sure, the, the people who are here, they must have now realized it, that there is some surprise element as well. So I'm sure I think the, the people who will be interacting with you would have a, a great benefit of interacting. Uh, and this is not, as I said, this is just the beginning. And uh, uh, this is, we, play, we are at this point of time, you can say we are play, playing T20. But we will expect you for a test match, actually, uh, which will be very elaborate and uh, very exhaustive one. But I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm on behalf of Bits Pilani and particularly Pilani campus. I am really grateful that uh, you you have uh, uh, spared your precious time and interacting with all the people here. And uh, Sharmila, I think you you did a splendid job of 
all taking care of all the questions at the right time, like a commercial break so that the monotony has been broken there and the, 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 the orientation comes out to the questions and all that. So that was a that was a fantastic thing. So once again, I think to Bitsa International and the Bitsa, of course, Silicon Valley chapter and Department of Management. I really, I, I really appreciate it. And of course, the, without go, uh, saying it goes that about Professor Arya Kumar and Sachin Arya, who have been a kind of a, the backbone of the whole thing from our institute here. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please do uh, fill in that uh, feedback form. That will be very helpful for us to plan and uh, orient the next few set of lectures uh, correctly. So uh, thank you again, Vikram, for your time. And thank you, Professor Neetu. I guess uh, we'll call it uh, 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 the end of the session now. Thanks again. Yeah. 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 So Neetu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Sharmila. Thank you, Vikram. And it's really uh, great to hear you and the entry that we have shown. And I'm sure that students, they really enjoyed this. So with this, we uh, end up the session of the talk. And this will be followed by an evaluation. So I think uh, uh, Vikram was kind enough to help us in setting up this evaluation. So I thank you, Vikram, for this. And again, thank you for the surprise element that you are giving. So I think students, you have a great opportunity to interact again with Vikram and that to on one to one. So we'll select three best performers in the evaluation that is just going to happen immediately after this. And we'll announce the results and we'll get in touch with Vikram. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Burai, to be with us. And uh, thank you for all your support. Yeah, thank, thank you, sir. You. Yeah. All right. So thank you for the so opportunity, everyone. So connect now and give it to that. Thank you, Vikram. And we stay connected. Thank you. Sure. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Have a, have a nice evening and bye bye. And thank you, Sharmila and Pramila also. So have so a Pramila nice day. Yeah, Pramila. Thank you so Pramila much, Pramila. Joined us, sir. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful, Hello, uh, Pramila. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. So we, we disconnect now. You'll uh, carry out your evaluation process. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll do that. We'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.